Good day, everybody. This is uh, Chris back again at the Ancient Scholar, and now we're going to go ahead and uh, finish this series of videos that I've been doing on the uh, uh, enzyme kinetics, or the kinetics of enzymes, at least in this sense. And so we left off talking about the Lineweaver Burke plot. We talked about what that was all about. And now what I'm going to do is going to go into something seemingly different, but we'll actually tie it all back together. Okay, so the next concept that I want to talk about, we can just kind of keep the line weaver Burt plot in the back of our heads. The next concept that I want to talk about is the concept of enzyme inhibitors. And there are really two different types of enzyme inhibitors. There are what we call competitive inhibitors. So I'll just write that up here. Competitive inhibitors. competitive inhibitors and competitive inhibitors work by interacting with the enzyme and the take home point with them is they look they look like the substrate All right, they look like the substrate. So let's just say, we're going to do a very simplified version of this. Let's say that I have an enzyme here. And the enzyme, again, we're, we're going to oversimplify this. All right, looks like this here. All right. So, oh boy, that's, there we go. Okay, that's my enzyme, okay? And this is the active site of the enzyme right here, okay? And this is the actual substrate. So I'll put an S there for the. So the substrate fits into the enzyme. The chemical reaction can proceed efficiently. And out pops, I don't know, the product, the uh, metabolite. Maybe it looks like that. All right. So the competitive inhibitor is something that is not the substrate but maybe it looks it looks there we go so that is the competitive inhibitor it looks like the substrate or a lot like the substrate and so what can happen is that competitive inhibitor can compete with the substrate for binding at the active site and the competitive inhibitor can bind at the active site. Once it binds here, then the enzyme is no longer able to inter interact with the substrate. And hopefully that's a pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty intuitive situation that's going on there. Um, and a key concept then to take home is that we can overcome this by increasing, okay, by increasing the concentration of the substrate. All right. If I increase the, the concentration of the substrate, uh, that will increase the ratio, the ratio of uh, the substrate um, to the inhibitor. All right. And if I have significantly more, so let's say I just have one, one inhibitor molecule, but I increase the number of substrate molecules significantly, okay. Now the, the chance of the inhibitor actually finding an enzyme to inhibit is much lower than the chance of substrate finding the enzyme. So um, the probability is much higher for the substrate um, interacting with the enzyme versus the inhibitor. Uh, so how could the inhibitor then overcome the situation? Well, it would have to compete with the substrate, and the best way to compete would be to add more inhibitor and have more inhibitor uh, molecules and substrate molecules competing for the active sites of the enzymes. So uh, a good, a good take-home concept here is that if I increase, 
the substrate concentration, I can overcome um, the inhibitor. Okay, that's a competitive inhibitor. And then there is also something known as a non, a non competitive, a non competitive inhibitor. And a non competitive inhibitor does not bind at the active site. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to replicate this situation up here again. So here I have my enzyme. All right. Looks something like this. All right. So now I have my substrate. All right. Substrate's still going to want to interact and I'm still going to be producing some sort of, sort of product or a, a metabolite. <clears throat> Now my inhibitor is not going to look like the active site, but rather maybe my inhibitor looks like this. And so that inhibitor is able to attach to another part, a, a, a part of the enzyme that is not the active site, but the fact that that inhibitor can attach to the enzyme can still inhibit the enzyme. So what happens here? Well, the substrate is free to bind with the enzyme, okay? The substrate can still bind, but the enzyme will not function correctly, so it will not catalyze the substrate to a product reaction like it should. Uh, so in this sense, it doesn't matter how many substrate molecules I add. If the enzyme is inhibited, the enzyme's inhibited. And that's just the way it is. It's not a, a matter of competing with a substrate. This doesn't need to compete um, with the substrate at all because it binds to an, a, a site on the enzyme um, that is not the active site of the enzyme. Okay, so what happens to the reaction kinetics when, when inhibitors are involved? Well, let's just talk about the competitive inhibitors, okay? Or maybe what I'll do is um, I will draw a table here and I will have competitive, all right, here on this side and then non competitive on this side here, all right, and uh, I'll have the, what we'll do is, uh, I'll draw this here, and I'll have the V max, the maximum velocity, all right, here, all right, well, that's terrible, but that's all right. And then I will have the Km, the Michaelis constant down here. And look at that. I don't need that stuff there. I'll just get rid of it. Okay. So we're going to look at the Km and the Vmax here. We're going to compare and contrast these guys. So let's talk about the competitive inhibitors first. That looks like a kindergartner drew it, but uh, that's okay. All right, so we have competitive, non -competitive. Okay, so what happens in the, in the situation um, where I have a competitive? Well, with competitive inhibitors, um, assuming that I can compete, okay, I can add substrate and compete with this, okay, we'll make that assumption. What's going to happen to my Vmax in that situation? Well, the Vmax is not really going to change significantly. There's not, so there's going to be, uh, maybe not negative. Negative is probably not the right thing to use. So we'll say there will be, there'll be, 
assuming that we can compete, okay, assuming that we have a competitive situation, um, there will be no change in the Vmax. However, what's going to happen to the Km? Well, as the molecules, the inhibitor molecules, bind to the enzymes, um, they are going to change the enzyme's affinity for the substrate, right? The overall affinity will begin to uh, decrease. Uh, the enzymes that are bound, that are inhibited, will not have affinity. So the affinity is going to um, decrease, and if you remember, the relationship is inverse between um, Km and affinity, so in a competitive situation, we will actually see the Km increase. All right. Now let's look at non-competitive inhibitors. So here I've got my non-competitive hitter. What's happening here? Well, this is not competing with the binding site, right? So the substrate is free to bind. So the affinity that the substrate has for the enzyme, or the enzyme has for the substrate, that affinity is not going to change, right? It's free to bind even though the chemical reaction is not going to occur, the substrate can still bind because the active site is not the site that has been um, inhibited. So we can say that in, in the case of a non-competitive inhibitor, the Km value, there will be no change in the Km value. Oop, there's the dryer. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, continuing on here. So there will be no change in the Km value because the affinity is not going to change. The active site is not the site that's involved. However, because the enzyme is still being inhibited, the Vmax is going to slow down. There's going to be a decrease in the Vmax. So up here with my Vmax, I will see the Vmax decrease. Okay, so now that we know what competitive and non-competitive inhibitors do to the Vmax and the Km values, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to um, plot out a couple of, of um, line, uh, a couple of uh, uh, line weaver Burke plots for you guys. So let's do that here, um, and maybe I'll make the plots a dark color. All right, so what I'm going to do uh, up top here is I'm going to do this plot here, all right, and this is going to be a normal situation, okay? So my enzyme is, is not inhibited in any sort of way, all right? So remember, my uh, x-axis is 1 over the substrate concentration. My y-axis is 1 over the velocity of the reaction and it is going to look something like this here all right something like this here and if you remember choose a different color um, this the y-intercept is the v max and the x-intercept here is going to be representative of the uh, Km. Uh, of course, these, all, these are um, inverse values. Okay, so now what I want to do is, <clears throat> using the information that we have here, let's go ahead and graph out what will happen in a situation where I have a competitive, I have a competitive inhibitor. All right, so... Let me draw this again. All right, so what's going to happen with a competitive inhibitor? So we'll go back. We've got this situation here, and we're assuming we can compete. Um, if we can compete, then the Vmax, uh, the, the velocity, is not going to change, but the, the enzyme affinity is going to do what? Well, it's going to decrease. So I'm going to see no change in the Vmax, but an increase in the uh, Km. 
All right, so what's going to happen here is um, I am going to have something like this ah, here. All right, something like this here. All right, so my Vmax is the same here, okay? So there's no change in the Vmax here, but see where my KM value is here. So my an original KM value is here. So what has happened is this is shifted to the right and my KM value is now closer to zero here. So my KM value, my KM value has increased. Okay, which means that the affinity has decreased. And that's what I'd see with a competitive inhibitor. And then let's just go ahead and finish this up with a non-competitive inhibitor as well. A non-competitive inhibitor. So I'll draw that, that. All right, so now if we go back and look at what's going to happen with our non-competitive header, the constant will be the Km. I won't have a change in my Km, but the Vmax is going to decrease. So um, we'll drop this down here, here. So my Km is still going to stay here, but my Vmax is going to decrease. And remember, decreasing in the um, line weaver Burke, decreasing um, Vmax because this is a, a reciprocal um, is going to be up, whereas an increase would be down. So this here, the Y intercept is going to move up. So let's say that I move the Y intercept to here. All right, and then I'll draw my line like so. All right, so we'll just. All right, so this was my original Vmax here, and so my Vmax has gone up here, which actually means that it has decreased. So I have a decrease in the Vmax, right? And here, okay, my Km, there has been no change, negative change, um, in the Km value. Um, so, um, let me just go back up to normal and we'll draw all three of these guys in. So, um, normal here and then the next line that I'm going to draw will be a competitive inhibitor. Alright, so the competitive inhibitor did something like that. That's this guy here. Alright, and then the non-competitive inhibitor um, we'll do a completely different color there. That's this guy here, okay? So in this case, the Km remained the same, but the, the Vmax decreased, so I got something that looked like this, all right? So that's my non-competitive inhibitor, and this is my competitive inhibitor here if we were to look at all all three things happening at the at the same time if we were to graph them on top of each other okay guys hopefully that made sense and hopefully you can see the utility of graphing um, using uh, the line weaver Burke plots um, when we're testing uh, substances that may or may not um, inhibit the uh, function of enzymes Okay, guys, as always, thanks for hanging in there.